ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, on behalf of the contributors of Lexon Forum Law Review and Sakola's publications, Athens Thessaloniki, we welcome you to today's 10th conference of uh, our journal, this time on the international dimension of intellectual property disputes. Although this is not the first time that our journal is hosting a leading for, uh, foreign scholar at its events, it is the first time that the entire event is in English. This conference is very special for us. Today, we have the great honor of hosting three world leading scientists from literally all corners of the globe and the rare privilege of learning from them in a joint event which has attracted the interest of an extremely large number of participants from all over the world, from the USA, Canada, Australia, India, Peru, Russia, Turkey, Armenia, and of course, all over the European Union. This is indeed a very rare and therefore extremely valuable experience, which our prestigious guests have generously reserved for a legal journal from a small European country such as Greece, but with a great tradition in international law in particular. Professor Marqueta Trimble, Samuel A. Lionel, Professor of Intellectual Law at the University of Nevada, specializes in international intellectual property law and has published extensively on the intersection of conflict of law and intellectual property law. She is an elected member of the American Law Institute of Comparative Law and the member of Scientific Advisory Board of the Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition. Professor Dan Jerker Svandeson from Bond University in Australia is an expert on cross-border legal issues with special focus on the internet. He is considered the field leader in technology law. Professor Svandeson is contributing to our journal's undertakings with great willingness and devotion for the third time as a speaker in a conference or an author in a volume of our review, which is why we are honored to consider him as a close partner in the most challenging of issues. Both above mentioned professors have not only honored us with their presence, but are currently sacrificing hours of rest to be with us at undoubtedly inconvenient hours for them. As now in Queensland, Australia, it is one o'clock after midnight and in Nevada, eight o'clock in the morning. Professor Gerald Spindler is the head of chair of civil law, commercial law and economic law, comparative law, multimedia and telecommunication law, and uh, at the famous University of Göttingen in Germany. He teaches, among others, electronic commerce, intellectual property law, inter international private law, and economic analysis of law. Professor Spindler is an old dear and close friend from our early years at the University of Frankfurt. Although we have followed a different scientific path, it is an absolute pleasure that a delightful coincidence, Lexen Forum, bring us together again. Standing alongside these leading professors as a representative of the younger generation of academics is Dr. Ioannis Revolidis, resident academic lecturer on communication and technology law at the University of Malta. Dr. Revolidis was graduate and PhD student of our Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and has since then spread his wings to higher academic heavens, teaching at universities in Germany, Cyprus, and Malta. Dr. Revolidis, an invaluable member of Lexen Forum Review, is the soul of our event today. Without him, today's conference simply would not have been possible. To all of today's leading speakers, Lexen Forum expresses its gratitude for their honorable presence and the confidence and support they saw in our efforts. Special thanks are also due to the chair of today's session, 
professor of commercial law at the University of Athens, Ms. Leah Athanasiou. Professor Athanasiou, honored us by chairing and also by giving an excellent presentation at one of our former conferences on maritime disputes on the world map, where for the first time we had a presentation in a foreign language by a Lindic foreign professor, and already with a, her depth of knowledge and her highest communication skills, she honors us again at our first conference that is conducted all in English. Thank you all for your presence from all around the world. And let me now give the floor to President Athanasiou to chair our extremely interesting discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Paris Arvanitakis, dear colleague. My first thing is to congratulate you for hosting, for organizing and hosting this special event on a subject which is on the top of the international agenda from an academic, economic and policy point of view. Congratulations also to Sakula's publications for this, for providing the platform and the organization process for that. I must say that uh, we all live and work in a digital environment. If we combine that with uh, the cross-border character of international transactions, we more or less understand how vulnerable has become the protection of IP rights. More than that, how the new situation has affected our traditional approach of legal rules on jurisdiction, on private international law, but also on substantive law like competition, consumer protection, and protection on private data. So we try now to find solutions. It's, as I said before, on the top of the international agenda. If we are going to find a uniform solution all around the world, if we are going to proceed with ex ante regulation, as it was the solution adopted by the European Union, if we are going to reform our traditional remedies, action for damages, injunctions, or other remedies, and how we are going to find a solution that would be, um, I would say, efficient for the protection of IP rights all around the world. I'm honored to join this panel not as a chair, but mostly as a learner, in order to hear and to learn from the most distinguished colleagues from all over the world, persons that have published a lot, reflected a lot, and I'm sure that this discussion of today will provoke very interesting questions, interesting debates, and will open the path to reproduce the discussion in a physical way in Thessaloniki or elsewhere in Greece. So without wasting more of your time, I would like to present, you did it already, Professor Arvanitakis, I would like to start to pass the floor to our first speaker, Professor Svanteson, is going to present us the intellectual property disputes and private international law with the great advantage of the comparison of a continental system, a Swedish system, and the Australian, that means a common law perspective. Uh, I would like to advise the audience that after the end of Professor Svanteson presentation, you will be able to ask questions and then Professor will revert to you in clarifying issues that you would desire to have more information on that. Professor Svanteson, with our sincere welcome, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and, and thank you so much for the invitation. It's a great honor for me to again have a pleasure of joining uh, your events here. Um, it's, it's fantastic to also be on a panel with some good friends uh, who I look forward to learning from as well. So it's wonderful to be here. Now, as you can see from the slide here, I started like I ended my last presentation, I, I 
ended then with some shameless self-promotion and I'm now starting with some self-promotion too but this time I have some innocent reasons too for promoting my this is my most recent book from 2021 uh, I bring this up because it highlights that I've worked in this field from the perspective of private international law in relation to the internet so while the topic I've been given is intellectual property disputes and, and private international law generally, my perspective is going to be um, uh, almost exclusively from the internet type uh, angle. I also think the, the color combination that I chose for my book here could not be more current. Of course, we see this blue and yellow everywhere for good reasons. Uh, right. Now, um, before I get started with a serious bit, I want to start with something slightly less serious because I wonder if it was a coincidence that we have this event today. Today is an important day because of this event, of course, but it's also an important event, event for a lot of people due to the fact that this is, if I manage to change the slide, this is the, well, not official, but unofficial Star Wars Day, May the 4th. Um, it is a well-known fact for a lot of people around the world, but maybe not to, to everyone. The reason I did bring it up, though, is uh, Star Wars is a good illustration of just how much emphasis is placed on intellectual property. Uh, the reason that these famous movies have become so successful is largely attributed, yeah, by a lot of people at least, to the way that the intellectual property matters have been handled along the way. And you know, put some figures there as to about how much uh, influence intellectual property has had in, in relation to this Star Wars universe. But I also, out of curiosity, then did a search combining the Star Wars intellectual property and private international law, and it generated no less than 357,000 results. So there's clearly some uh, legal overlap uh, as well here. And one of the reasons for that is I have a judgment on your screen to your bottom left. Um, that is a private international law intellectual property case involving Star Wars matters. In fact, there's even at least one scholar that has sought to analyze the whole Star Wars saga from an intellectual property perspective. Uh, I've seen similar exercises in relation to cybersecurity and so on. Uh, it's, it's taken on a, a life of its own. But that's enough about that sort of is start about the day that we have here. And I want to start with what really is the problem that we're facing here. And uh, again, I will then look at this from the perspective uh, of the, how the internet has complicated uh, the things that we deal with in the cross section between private international law and intellectual property. Now, I started uh, looking at what courts have been saying, and I obviously had to limit myself. So I brought up one quote here from the Federal Court of Australia from now over 10 years ago, but the court here made the point that um, the challenge for intellectual property law presented by the irrelevance of the physical geography in cyberspace is to reconcile that irrelevance with the limits of jurisdictional competence in the protection under domestic law of local intellectual property rights. I suppose this is mainly really uh, uh, just a complicated way of pointing to what is well known, the lacking territoriality of cyberspace combined with how law is structured in a, in a territorial sense um, very much, it creates a clash. And uh, arguably intellectual property is an area where we are more than in other areas uh, taking a sort of territorial focus, even though it, territoriality might be losing its grip there too, to some degree. Now, more broadly, in the book that I showed you at the start, I have argued that there is uh, four uh, other issues that also uh, arise due to when we get into the sort of combination of private international law and the internet. And the first one is that there is an imbalance between the ease and cost effectiveness of cross-border contacts. Uh, and the difficulty of uh, an expense, of course, of solving cross-border disputes, on the other hand, right? 
Uh, even though we have seen some progress in, let's say, uh, various forms of ADR and so on, this remains one of the fundamental challenges for us. It is easy to get into contact with people from other countries via the internet, but it's very expensive to deal with cross-border disputes still. I'm not sure that we are going to have any um, uh, solutions to that, at least not in the short term. Perhaps AI can uh, save us very well, as the sort of optimists seem to be thinking about a lot of different fields at the moment. Certain rules, this point two here, then, certain rules of private international law have lost their logical appeal. Uh, and I think for good reasons, probably, uh, lawyers in general and private international law lawyers in particular are quite conservative and we don't see a reform maybe as quickly as we need to. Um, so this is something to work. Uh, the third point is that those active on the internet may lack sufficient notice as to which laws govern their conduct and in which forums they potentially can be sued. Again, this is one of the sort of core challenges that I don't see obvious solutions to, and uh, not the way our laws are structured. And again, maybe AI can be the rescue there. I, I wrote something on that in 2019, um, a short piece in the Harvard International Law Journal, but uh, certainly a lot of work remains to be done there. The last one points to the sort of international clashes that I think we're going to keep seeing, and I'm going to get back to that later in the presentation. There is an exist, well, the existing gap between reasonable grounds for jurisdictional claims and reasonable grounds for recognition and enforcement has been severely widened. Court, the countries are happy to claim jurisdiction in a broad way, but uh, do not want to recognize foreign jurisdictional claims to the same extent. That is natural, uh, but it remains an issue. Let's now move on to Sweden specifically. And, and, and I've tried to think of what is a good symbol for Sweden and not this one, because it is a common symbol for Sweden. Some of you would have seen this so-called Dala Hest uh, before, but it's also interesting to talk about it because it is just yesterday morning in the news, I was reading that this type of uh, item like this famous Swedish dollar is, is going to uh, get specific protection within the European Union, much the way that uh, certain food products and, and drinks like champagne and so on are protected. So there's uh, others would know more about it, but I wanted to flag it because it's an an interesting aspect. Now, so Sweden being a, a, a civil law country uh, shares a lot of features and, and characteristics with other civil law countries, of course, when it comes to jurisdiction. Uh, Sweden's law is often seen as a little bit of an, a different system to the, to the continental civil law systems, but we can leave that aside for now. What, what is interesting is that the legislation in Sweden does not specifically contain rules around how to deal with uh, international disputes, rather we rely on Rettigons Balken, which sets jurisdictional rules for domestic disputes and apply them also to international disputes. And uh, Rettigons Balken 10.8, as I reproduce here, is the provision that is most often uh, uh, applied as a jurisdictional ground for claims in, in the IP area. Actions due to a damaging act may be brought before the the core place where the act was committed or the play or where damages occurred. If act was committed or the damage occurred in places under different courts, the action may be brought uh, before each of them. Uh, so this is probably familiar to anyone uh, familiar with EU law, which I think most people here will be. So, uh, and I should stress that even this domestic principle uh, or rule or law is interpreted often even in light of EU law. So the similarity with Brussels regulation is, is both in wording and application. Now, the famous case that I wanted to address is the Tildén case, where we had a Norwegian um, company that on its website in Norway, from Norway, displayed a photograph, uh, the photograph, the, the copyright 
holder in relation to that photograph was a Swedish company um, based uh, in Stockholm. Now, the case was complicated by things that doesn't concern us so much in that the, the company in question ceased to exist throughout the appeals process um, and the rights of the company was taken over by the sole owner of the company. So there were some issues there that we don't need to focus on here, but that adds a little bit of a twist to the case. Now, so the matter was, could this uh, Swedish rights holder take action before the courts in Stockholm uh, against this Norwegian company for the infringement? Now, this was decided uh, at the time when uh, the Lugano Convention of 1988 was a relevant law, but it was read in light of the Brussels I regulation. And the court, uh, once this then reached the Supreme Court of uh, Sweden, uh, the court made a big point about that. Now, in the lower courts, they concluded that Sweden did not have jurisdiction under what was an Article 5.3 of the Lugano Convention. Um, but once this reached the Swedish Supreme Court, uh, a favorable ruling uh, was made um, for this Swedish uh, rights holder. And the ruling was very much then influenced by the E-Date case, which we all know related to the protection of personality rights. And now the court divided the matter before them into two parts, damages for the economic rights being one and damages for moral rights being something quite different. In relation to damages for the economic rights, the court said that as far as economic damage is concerned, the rights holder, ME, claims compensation only for such damage that he claims has occurred in Sweden. According to the judgment of the ECJ in the Beer case, uh, the court in the place where the damage has occurred has jurisdiction. Already, according to that principle, there is therefore Swedish jurisdiction also with regard to ME's claims for compensation for financial damages. That part is probably a uh, unsurprising now uh, or at least less surprising perhaps when the way the court dealt with the um, moral rights as to the moral rights court drew upon the um, edate case and said that compensation for damages to moral rights aims to, for example to protect artists against violations of their reputation and of us of a kind akin to the compensation for violation of personality rights that the ECJ addressed in its decision in E Date and Martinez. Uh, the considerations that form the basis of the court's decisions in that case apply in this case as well. There is therefore reason to apply the principles from the judgment to the question of jurisdiction as far as uh, ME's claims for compensation for damage to moral rights is concerned. So here you can see that the uh, copyright-based claim, in a sense, is split into two parts. Moral rights is treated the same as uh, a claim for violations of personality rights. Of course, um, this is not something that we've seen in the, uh, in the courts uh, in, in Europe, elsewhere, I think. Uh, but this case, even though it's now more than 10 years old, remains good law in Sweden. And, and hopefully we'll get to see how, um, how uh, other courts will deal with this sort of matter. I can see, personally, I must say, I can see the logic of the court's reasoning here. Uh, at the same time, I can also see some problems uh, stemming from this approach. One thing that I wanted to speak a little bit about now then is, as you know, uh, the e date approach, uh, and we see similar if, uh, approaches in, in uh, other contexts, might allow us to um, discuss what does it mean with all the damages. Under e date, if you're suing at your center of interest, or in fact, based on the basic application of a Brussels regulation, if you sue where the defendant is uh, residing, uh, you can uh, sue for all the damages, while if you go to other courts, you have to uh, apply 
if for damages only for the local damages. So the question that has arisen is, what does it mean with all the damages? We see that come up in the Cheville case, it comes up in E-date, Bulogs of loosening and, and so forth. Uh, the debate then is, does this all the damage refer to EU-wide damage or does it refer to worldwide damage? When I discuss this with European colleagues, they don't seem terribly, often don't seem very concerned or, or even interested in that question. But to me, that is quite an important one. Um, so I've had some arguments around that. I would say that if we look at the Cheville case, it is only relating to circulation discussed within member states. So that Cheville did not raise this prospect that all the damages could possibly relate to worldwide the situation. And E-date uh, did not change that. There's no express uh, a claim or even an, an implied claim that uh, the all uh, is expanded via the, uh, the E-date case. Things change, though, when it comes to the Bulldog sublacing case that you're probably all familiar with, too, where Advocate General Bobek said that there is just one website. It simply cannot be rectified or deleted only in proportion to the harms of suffered in a given territory. Um, and the court sort of followed that reasoning and talked about an application for rectification of uh, content uh, or removal of it uh, is a single and indivisible application. They put simply the idea is then that since we can only delete globally or not at all, uh, in a sense, when we talk about all uh, deleting for the all must uh, be for the whole world as such. But as both me and Marketa and others have been writing about for many, many years now, at least 20 years uh, since my first writing on it, uh, there is something called geolocation technologies that certainly allow us to uh, have different content on different sites based on geography. So the whole reasoning here does not quite hold up. And it, I must say, if Bulogs in Placing in was intended to change the meaning of all the damages from EU-wide to worldwide, I think that's a big step and the court should have made that expressly clear. At least when it comes to sort of personality rights, uh, it's also true that there is no harmonization on substance. And even though we have greater harmonization when it comes to intellectual property law, it is no, not by any means uniform throughout the world. So a, a European decision might not at all be in line with uh, attitudes in other parts of the world. Final point on this, the whole discussion about all, I would say that the mosaic principle by its very sort of reference suggests that we can only talk about all meaning EU-wide, not worldwide, because if all the pieces of a mosaic is the individual countries of Europe, when you put them together, all those pieces form Europe. They don't form the whole world. And, and therefore, in my view of seeing things, we cannot view um, uh, all as referring to worldwide. There is support for this when the EU has had to comment on other countries' claims of jurisdiction. I just in include here the European Commission's amicus brief filed in a sort of controversial Microsoft warrant case. Uh, I'm not going to read it in the interest of time, but it's there for your future reference. What I will emphasize, though, is uh, uh, Advocate General Hogan in the recent GT Flix case clearly seems to be taking a view that all of the damages, which is often described as full jurisdiction, um, refers to EU-wide only, as I include in this here. But enough about this particular aspect, and I now want to move on to Australia, uh, or kind of Australia. I'll explain what I mean. So Australia has taken a very aggressive approach to extraterritorial approaches to with the internet in, in many ways. Um, it's exemplified here in the Copyright Act, Section 115, a that gives uh, rights owners uh, the power to get to court to get an injunction requiring carriage uh, services 
providers to take steps to prevent certain content to be available in Australia and so on, even though it's originates from outside. Uh, and the excellent Twitter case is a good illustration of just how uh, aggressive in an extraterritorial sense the Australian courts have been. Uh, but it's not only Australia that is uh, favoring worldwide uh, claims of jurisdiction. Uh, and it's not just Europe either. Uh, we've seen here in the Canadian case of Equistec that is well known that the court was reasoning that to be effective, a blocking order needed to be uh, worldwide rather than limited to, to Canada. So this is a topic that I discussed already a year ago when I l last uh, presented in uh, the Lex Forum. Um, and the issue that this then relates to, in my view, is that of scope of jurisdiction. So once we decide that a court has jurisdiction, it has to decide how broad that is. Is it local? Is it global? Or is it somewhere in between? And I think we can talk about that when it's scope of jurisdiction. The, there is a trend internationally, I think, of increasingly wide, uh, or it's becoming normalized the idea that uh, the scope of jurisdiction should be territorially unlimited and I include two references here to the relatively recent ILA guidelines on intellectual property uh, for your future reference. The concern and the reason why I keep coming back to this point and what I want to make clear here, the risk I'm seeing is broad claims of scope of jurisdiction are directed at internet intermediaries can completely disrupt the private international law system. So the example that I gave last time, I want to very quickly run through it here because I, not everyone, of course, attended last time, is this. Let's say that I sit in Australia and post something on a US-based platform. Let's say that that happens to violate or we argue to violate some uh, intellectual property rights in uh, China while it's perfectly legal in both US and in Australia. A Chinese judgment would then, against me, would need to be enforced in Australia and the need for recognition and enforcement works to balance the system so that even a broad claim of jurisdiction from China uh, over me as a foreigner is balanced out by the need for the recognition and enforcement. That is entirely removed when we get to uh, the global scope of jurisdiction claims combined then uh, where they be directed at the platform. If LinkedIn is told to remove the uh, posting I have made due to Chinese law, and if they comply, perhaps for a variety of reasons, the, the only country's law that then determines whether or not this content is available globally is Chinese law. Australian law, where I was acting, doesn't matter. Uh, US law, where uh, the content was hosted, will not matter. Uh, Chinese law gets a sort of um, priority over those countries' laws then in those sort of matters. And the lack of need for recognition and enforcement then undermines the entire private international law system. This is a main concern for me, and therefore I wanted to uh, revisit it here today. Put simply, the global orders are, are uh, the most effective uh, in whatever we're dealing with, but we need to be careful. Global orders are justified in some, but not all cases, and the global orders should not be the default position. And I think this applies in intellectual property as well as it does elsewhere. All right. In the interest of time, I'm going to move to Australia now, um, symbolized by a photo from my garden the other day. Very nice animals here too, not just the scary ones. Now, the rules of jurisdiction in Australia can be broken down into three categories as in common for common law countries. Uh, jurisdiction can be based on presence, submissions, or as allowed under the relevant court law rules. So each court has its own court rules outlining when it would claim jurisdiction um, and um, that complicates the system quite a bit and it's only recently that we've seen a greater degree of 
harmonization between the courts. So otherwise, if you were instigating a claim in the federal court, uh, the court rules were quite different to the rules of uh, New South Wales, or they are still different to those of Western Australia and so forth. Now, there has been reform with the federal court rules in particular now, coming into force just earlier this year. So the federal court rules uh, were amended with the aim of greater harmonization. And I think uh, this is interesting because in the end, it also means that the federal court's uh, rules are more accommodating for claims against uh, foreign parties. Uh, now, you can see some examples. I wanted to include just some very brief example here of an example of how they have become more accommodating. You know, under the old rules, you could instigate an action based on proceedings based on a tort committed in Australia. That has been, in a sense, watered down to uh, you can instigate proceedings if, that, if a tortious act or omission was done wholly or partly in Australia. So you can see how it's now a little bit more accommodating. I include another example here, but I will not uh, look at that in detail. Now, I wanted to talk about two Australian cases, uh, or rather like this, I wanted to note one uh, famous case and talk a little bit more about a not so famous case. The famous case is the Ward Group case from 2005, and it came about due to uh, one company in, in the UK having trademark rights in a product and a hair anti-graying product or something like that, um, while another company in Australia had trademark rights in that same product uh, all over the world, pretty much, 70 countries around the world. The UK companies sold the product to distributors who then sold it to other parties who sold it on the internet, and uh, the Australian right holder was concerned that when these products were being sold on the internet that would violate uh, uh, the trademark rights in Australia and uh, argued also that it was a matter of passing off which is a specific action that is often pleaded together with trademark actions like this in, in Australia. The reason this case is, is so important I would say is that it dealt with the issue of targeting at a quite an early stage, targeting or directing your activities to is now a standard mechanism in EU law to focus on. But uh, so this case was quite early dealing with that. I've included some information for, for your reading uh, later, because I assume that the slides will be distributed to participants. Uh, otherwise, feel free to contact me and I will send them out. Um, now, Moving then to the more recent and, and kind of confusing case of Sapphire. It related to the sort of uh, glass candles, uh, candles in a glass, more or less, uh, in the picture here, and the, the, the trademark glass house as used for uh, selling the products. The, uh, we can talk about this uh, blue and the yellow team. The blue team here on the left had the rights in Australia. And Mr. Staples, who in a sense started the yellow team, uh, had worked with the Sapphire company um, and later on started his own company, even Luxitico, in Hong Kong and registered the trademark of Glasshouse in uh, China. Uh, there was arguments that he had done so just to prevent the blue team from acting in the Chinese market, and he denied that, of course. These were parties who clearly did not like each other. There had been litigation in Hong Kong previously. Uh, there was, at the time of the action in Australia, there was an ongoing trademark action in China, under which then the blue team was disputing the yellow team's trademark in China. Parallel with that, then, the blue team took action uh, against uh, Luxitico and Mr. Staples in the courts in New South Wales. And the action there was not specifically on intellectual property, but had great impact on intellectual property. So they 
tor- the, the claim was a tortious claim being the intentional infliction of economic harm um, using unlawful means. And the, you can say that the blue team here was arguing that uh, uh, registering the trademark in question in China was an unlawful means of causing, intentionally causing economic harm to the Sapphire Group. Now, based on that, they sought an order from the Australian court in, in New South Wales, that, amongst other things, requiring that the defendants of a yellow team be restrained from exploiting the, the defendants' uh, Chinese marks and take steps to remove the defendants' Chinese marks or assign them to the plaintiff, to the blue team. So it's an interesting approach, I think, where it's an attempt to use Australian law to indirectly affect uh, the trademark rights under the Chinese uh, system. Uh, so that, that, I think, is an interesting one, and we see if that's going to be, become more common. When it comes to jurisdiction, the question was, was the tort? portion done partially, at least in Australia. The tortious action would have been the registration and it was not clear if Mr. Staples had uh, instructed someone uh, from Australia to uh, apply for the trademark, so that was unknown. But what was clear was the court said damages were certainly uh, sustained in Australia. And in fact, it pointed to an earlier decision showing that any a time an, an Australian company suffered economic loss, it does so in Australia and therefore damages are suffered there. So the threshold for claiming jurisdiction is very, very low in a matter like this. The court also dealt with uh, the forum non-convenience type uh, aspect of the court rules. I'm not going to get into it uh, because there's too much to say about it. What I want to say though is that in the end, the very serious outcomes that it could have had were avoided because the court, uh, while the court claimed jurisdiction and said that uh, it was not a clearly inappropriate forum, it still decided this. I consider that these proceedings should be temporarily stayed pending completion of a trademark litigation in China to the conclusion of the current appeal process and then any retrial by the Supreme People's Court, leading to a final determination by the Chinese Intellectual Property Authority or whatever that stands for in respect of the trademark. So they paused the matter, giving preference to China to sort out whether or not the registration had been an unlawful means in the first place. And I can see certainly the merits of this. At the same time, I wonder if there's systems in the world in relation to which relying on the foreign judgments in, to this degree are not going to be realistic. And, and in any case, I think this highlights something and it links us into a bigger picture. Countries are more and more competitive. The international arena is more and more competitive. And we see it, for example, in how China in 2021 introduced its rules on contracting unjustified extraterritorial application of foreign legislation and other measures, with partly the aim being to counteracting the impact on China caused by what they call unjustified extraterritorial application of foreign legislation. So these sort of extraterritoriality shields, I think, are going to become more common at the same time as if we see time and time again how an action domestically can have international uh, consequences. And uh, so I predict that we're going to see a hardening climate, and I think that. Um, we will have to take that into account also in how laws are structured in in uh, the cross section of private international law and uh, intellectual property. Thank you very much. That brings me to the end of my presentation, and I will stop sharing and open the Q and A part that is empty. All right. I hope that's a sign of clarity rather than a sign of uh, that it was a boring, uninteresting presentation. 
Thank you very so, much, Professor. Thank you very much indeed for this illuminating and comparative approach that gave us the opportunity to see how the two systems react vis-a-vis -vis the same problem. I would like to kindly invite all participants, perhaps I was not very clear at the beginning, to use, to take the opportunity to use the Q and T process. It is available to all participants in order to address questions to the panelists. And I think it's a real opportunity for us to have Professor Stevenson with us at one o'clock in the morning. And so please, take profit of this opportunity and address questions if you need clarification or you have any comments on what has been said until now. Uh, it goes the same for the panelists also if they want to join the discussion at this stage. Uh, for me, just a small question, Professor, if I'm allowed so, as far as we are waiting for uh, the participants to take over. You mentioned that um, as a matter of principle, global orders may be justified in some cases, but not, not in all. So could you give us some more clarification on that, some example where global orders could be justified, not as a default rule, but at least justified? Yes, I've worked on this topic mainly in the context of uh, areas like privacy and defamation rather than in the intellectual property setting. But I think they could have uh, examples also in the IP arena. But when it comes to, for example, um, distribution of um, secretly taken sexual images and things like that, those type of situations, I think a global order is only positive. The removal, it's, it can be a great sense of embarrassment for a person that that sort of a material is out there, even if the people who see it don't know who the, uh, the victim is as such. So their global orders are completely justified. In other settings, I think there needs to be, if you think about the original uh, privacy case on right to be forgotten, the Gonzalez case, um, a global order removing this information might not be necessary because people in around the world, Peru and Argentina, Australia, would not care about uh, Mr. Gonzalez's previous economic uh, situation. So these are different situations, one where global orders is justified, one where they are not. And, and others, I think, might be a better place to uh, translate that reasoning into the IP arena. IP right, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any question for the moment. I wonder if the other panelists, they would like to join on this uh, subject. Otherwise, uh, we could proceed. I understand, Professor, that it is already one o'clock, even almost two o'clock. We'd be delighted to have you during the whole panel. Of course, you're free to leave us, but uh, we are also very much welcome to remain with us for the further discussion. And I am allowed to proceed with our second uh, distinguished panelist. For the newcomers, I would like to, uh, to repeat that um, uh, Professor Maketa Trimple is professor at the University of Nevada. She's specializing in international intellectual property law and has published and continues to publish extensively on issues on conflict of laws and private international law and intellectual property law. Uh, she's an elected member of the American Law Institute and also member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Max Planck Institute. So we are honored to have her with us and we are looking forward to hear about the territorial discrepancy between intellectual property rights, infringement claims and remedies. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Atanasio, for the kind introduction, and also to Professor Avanitakis for the invitation to speak uh, to you today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to join you. There is no other place I would like to be more at this time of the morning uh, than with friends and colleagues. Um, and it's wonderful to see so many of you also online. Uh, Professor Svantesen started by showing some books. Uh, so sure. Uh, enough. Um, his uh, volume is close by, always, even in Nevada, in the United States. Uh, the other book I would like to mention is actually the oldest volume uh, that I have in my office. It's a book from 1889 by uh, Carl Ludwig van Baar, who uh, it was published in Hanover, 
close uh, to one of our speakers' hearts. Um, and the book is really interesting because it shows that already in 1889, uh, Ludwig von Bar had the foresight of seeing problems that might arise in private international law when intellectual property rights or immaterial rights, as he referred to them, uh, will be at issue. So we often think, of course, about uh, the global uh, nature of the internet and all the legal issues uh, that are associated with the activities on the internet and how the internet complicates matters in private international law. But of course, in fact, many of the issues uh, of private international law have uh, followed uh, the intellectual property rights, uh, if not from their very beginning, since, uh, certainly since the beginning of uh, internationalization of intellectual property rights. So it's not a coincidence that um, Ludwig van Bar included an entire chapter on private international issues and IP law at a time when um, we uh, saw the first intellectual property law treaties uh, to be concluded at the international level. So um, let me talk today about um, remedies that are being awarded in intellectual property cases and what I term the territorial discrepancy between intellectual property claims and remedies. Professor Svantesson actually mentioned some of the examples, and so this will be a very natural uh, continuation uh, and follow-up on his presentation. So as we know, uh, the intellectual property rights uh, are governed in general by the principle of territoriality. In fact, uh, that's not completely accurate. There are certainly types of intellectual property rights, or at least some aspects of intellectual property rights that have a transnational nature. In trademark law, for instance, we have the well-known ARC doctrine that should uh, cross international borders. We know that thanks to the Berne Convention, copyright arises automatically in all countries that are parties to the Berne Convention. So there are certainly some aspects of intellectual property rights that have transnational character. But of course, in general, intellectual property rights, notwithstanding the great degree of um, international harmonization, and in some cases, regional harmonization, are still governed mostly by national laws, country by country. So there is this principle of territoriality. We have national laws governing uh, intellectual property rights. And yet, as Professor Svantesson also discussed, we see an increasing number of intellectual property disputes that involve activities and IP rights in more than one country. Again, this is quite uh, natural because uh, first of all, we now see intellectual property rights arising in parallel in multiple countries. Certainly that would be the case for copyright, maybe sometimes for well-known marks, but of course, thanks to regional mechanisms such as EU uh, trademark, EU design, and starting this year also the EU patent, the European patent with unitary effect, uh, we have raids that actually cross multiple countries, and we also have international applications for IP, um, such as the uh, PCT, the Patent Cooperation Treaty application. We have the Madrid Protocol application for trademarks in multiple countries. So it's actually easier to obtain rights in multiple countries, and infringement activity that occurs in multiple countries can then affect uh, these rates under multiple countries' laws. Undeniably, a great effect also is um, connected to the uh, fact that businesses are more and more operating in multiple countries, whether in the form of a multinational corporation or in uh, some other form. So definitely business activities uh, have spanned across national borders. And of course, the internet added an additional component, an additional 
uh, factor to this because we see that it's much more easier even for individual persons, for small businesses to engage in activities across national borders in multiple countries or even globally. So certainly despite the fact that IP rights are still territorial, we saw, uh, we see that um, these activities across national borders affect uh, them globally or multinationally. In these circumstances, it is understandable that IP owners, when they have to enforce their rights internationally, transnationally, uh, will seek to obtain remedies to get uh, remedies for as broad territory as possible. Many clients will, of course, hope to get remedies for everything that happened to them, no matter where on uh, the planet Earth, but it's not always possible. So at least they are seeking remedies that would be as territorially broad as possible. Now, the logical answer to that, uh, of course, is okay, well, you have to bring your infringement claims for multiple countries or even for all countries of the world if you want your remedies to cover all that scope. But that's of course not always possible. And in fact, intellectual property owners like any other uh, plaintiffs face many legal and also practical limitations as to the territorial scope of the claims that they can raise. And again, Professor Svantesson has already alluded to some of these limitations. First of all, uh, the IP owners might not own the particular IP right in every single country where the activity took place. Exceptions and limitations to the rights vary country to country, uh, and that can be a limitation on where they can bring claim or under which country law they can claim the infringement. In terms of personal jurisdiction, again, Professor Svantesson mentioned the Brussels I regulation rule and the increasing pressure indeed to expand the scope of jurisdiction and of the possibility of claiming remedies uh, for multiple countries. So as a general rule, general jurisdiction is usually associated with the possibility to claim rights and remedies under multiple countries' laws. But of course, courts of specific jurisdiction will typically, though not always, but typically limit the scope of claims only to the law of their own jurisdiction. So that's, of course, a limitation of its own. Ideally, the IP owner, in cases of multiple country infringements, would actually head to the court of general jurisdiction, but that's not always possible. Also, justiciability might limit how many countries can be included in the claim. Choice of law might be very limiting. Um, in many countries, uh, uh, it is necessary for the plaintiff to actually raise or plead foreign law in order for the court to be willing to apply foreign law. Um, in some countries, uh, maybe you don't have to prove foreign law, case in the United States now, but still courts will rely on the parties to show, to help the court, to assist the court with determining what the foreign law is. There are many evidentiary issues. You cannot go to court and allege that your rights were infringed globally if you cannot really prove infringement in all the different jurisdictions. And you might not be even able to prove damages. Of course, another story are many strategic considerations why IP rights owners might hesitate to bring claims in one court under multiple countries' laws. Um, a judge might wonder why the plaintiff is using that approach, whether seeking remedies in one key country or maybe few key countries would not suffice. And of course, in some countries, the doctrine of foreign non-convenience uh, might also limit what uh, the plaintiff uh, might do. So to conclude, the scope of claims is limited and yet IP rights owners will still desire to get remedies as wide as possible. And this can sometimes lead to the territorial discrepancy when the award, the injunction or uh, monetary remedies 
doesn't correspond to the territorial scope of the claims raised in the case. And I will talk briefly about a few examples of uh, where this happens and why it's a problem. First of all, let me address some false positives. Uh, sometimes people look at certain remedies and believe that they are examples of the discrepancy, but they might not be. On my list, for instance, consider vaguely formulated injunctions. In the United States, uh, courts, at least some courts, have issued injunctions in which they prohibited the defendant to infringe the IP rights globally. Clearly, that is not what the scope of the injunction should be because the claim originally is based only on US law. And it's really just a vaguely formulated injunction uh, that should not really um, be, was not intended to be really uh, global. Uh, some trademark cases, uh, passing off cases, might also create these types of injunctions. Of course, anti-suit injunctions might be viewed as extraterritorial because they order the defendant not to proceed somewhere else, uh, but it is an injunction targeting the defendant in the particular case. Similarly, you could view uh, the remedies, uh, meaning the SEP friend licenses that courts uh, decide on in these multinational cases these days as extraterritorial. Um, and they certainly are to the extent that the courts actually order the remedies for the world. But in fact, that's typically based on the scope of the underlying claim, which is a claim of violation of uh, contractual terms or a claim of infringement and uh, seeking really remedy of constructing the friend license for the standard essential patent, the SEP. So let me move to a real example of this discrepancy. And first, I would like to talk about a group of um, types of remedies that are really sort of established examples that should actually not surprise us because they have existed for quite some time. Uh, certainly, Mareva injunctions would uh, qualify as uh, the discrepancy, perhaps, uh, to the extent that they uh, target financial assets outside the jurisdiction for which the infringement is claimed. But also, um, it is established, uh, and we can see it uh, in court decisions, that often courts think of uh, remedies in intellectual property cases as uh, remedies to the scope that's necessary to prevent future infringements. And certainly that's something that the United States uh, Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit said in 1998 in a patent case, that to the extent that it's necessary to prevent future infringements, the court will issue remedies to whatever scope necessary. Again, in trade secrets cases, uh, of course, we will see injunctions that will be de facto global, uh, particularly if it consists of, please don't share this trade secret anymore um, with anybody in the world. So there may be also cases where uh, it doesn't really surprise us uh, that the remedy is beyond the scope of the original claim. Another example are foreign labeling requirements. In cases where, for instance, goods are imported to a country, they are manufactured somewhere else, and the court orders the defendant to label all future products as not intended for the United States or not to be sold in the United States and so forth. Uh, such an injunction, of course, uh, affects only business outside the United States, but yet to the extent that courts view such injunctions necessary, to protect intellectual property rights, uh, they might issue them as well. Of course, uh, Professor Svantesson talked at the length about um, injunctions on the internet. And uh, there, again, global effects seem to be the default. Although, again, going back to the question of geoblocking, geoblocking could certainly be used as a possible technical solution to limiting the scope of injunctions on the internet. And we have seen some courts using these, uh, though uh, surprisingly not as often in intellectual property cases as one would, uh, one would expect. Uh, in the Equistic versus 
Google case, for instance, uh, we have seen how, um, in fact, the, the non-defendant party, uh, Google, actually did offer to limit uh, the remedy or to limit uh, uh, the limitation to Canada, uh, first by doing .ca only and then discussing geoblocking. Uh, in the end, that's not what happened there, but it's certainly a case that shows that parties might actually be willing to geoblock in order to promote uh, access to content outside the jurisdiction in which the content has to uh, be um, uh, locked or not uh, visible. In fact, um, in the recent discussions of the EU anti-geoblocking regulation, we have already seen, perhaps surprisingly, um, some advocates for the public domain suggesting that geoblocking on the internet, in fact, can promote access to content, something that I would not have expected to see in my lifetime. So that's um, really interesting. Now, perhaps the most problematic uh, of these cases are damage awards that ended up with damages being awarded for violation of one country law, even when the damages actually arise outside that particular country. So in the United States, uh, the first example are, um, of course, cases of uh, the so-called predicate act doctrine, when courts decided that <clears throat> the defendant, in fact, holds the remedies, the profits, in trust for the U.S. plaintiff, and that the U.S. plaintiff may therefore get those foreign profits from the defendant. The oldest case on this is from 1939. It was Sheldon versus MGM. And in that case, the court said that indeed, if there is a predicate act, an act that was committed in the United States, and based on that one act, further activities happened outside the United States that just followed, flowed from that original act, uh, the copyright owner can collect profits uh, that arose from those additional acts outside the United States. Again, the theory being that the defendant, the infringement, uh, the infringer in this case, obtained profits and is holding those profits in trust uh, for the copyright owner. This was uh, uh, more uh, recently co um, confirmed by the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in 2003 in the case of LA News Service versus Reuters International. Um, it was um, a case that concerned footage of the LA riots um, at that time. And again, what happened was uh, in this case, there was one illegal copy of the footage made in the United States. And the copy was then sent abroad and showed and used outside the United States. So the act of infringement that happened in the US was creating one reproduction, one copy made in the United States, but the copyright owner was able to allege all those profits uh, that were made off of use of that footage of that rep illegal reproduction in other countries. No matter whether in those other countries they would have been covered by some copyright exception or limitation, no, no matter whether the copyright owner even owned those copyrights in those countries. It was based on that one predicate act in the United States, the copyright owner was given rights to those profits. Even more recently, in 2018, the US Supreme Court addressed the question of the territorial scope of remedies in a patent case. Uh, the case is called Western Gecko versus Ion Geophysical. And in that case, the US Supreme Court, using its recent uh, jurisprudence on the territorial scope, said that indeed, if US substantive law captures products that are assembled outside the United States, the remedies may also capture those kinds of activities outside the United States. 
The last case on the slide, Abitron versus Hetronic, actually addresses a somewhat of a reverse scenario and the so-called diversion of sales theory. In that case, uh, the trademark at issue is being used by companies in the United States, Austria, and Germany. And the question was whether activities of the Austrian and German defendants damage trademark rights in the United States. And the US trademark owner alleges that they should be awarded a remedies for sales of the Austrian and German company's goods outside the United States. And the theory here is again, that the US company was deprived of the opportunity to sell all those products outside the United States, and therefore their sales were diverted to those uh, sales of the Austrian and German company. This case is right now uh, before the US Supreme Court, which held a hearing for the case in mid-March, and we are expecting a decision by the Supreme Court in this case that should again clarify the territorial scope of the US trademark law, but also perhaps tell us a little bit about uh, the scope of remedies that may be awarded for infringement of that law. Finally, there are certainly other types of remedies that will have global effects. Uh, trade show remedies, of course, if you uh, award a remedy that concerns one trade show in, uh, let's say, Hanover, um, or in uh, Orlando, Chicago, Las Vegas, that little one injunction might have global effects uh, for the company. Certainly remedies such as public apology or publication of the judgment might also de facto affect companies globally. But of course, these are natural sort of effects of these types of injunctions and not something that we would find particularly appalling. There are many problems with the truly territorial discrepant uh, uh, issues and the discrepancy between claims and remedies. Uh, they make systems overlap. They de facto export intellectual property rights to other countries. Um, they might also affect other rights, other competing rights, for instance, also human rights and fundamental rights because they award remedies for countries where they might not really uh, be, these rights might not be infringed. And there are, of course, also reputational effects and significant potential enforcement problems. So there are some solutions to this. You could see how, for instance, a court could insist that the scope of remedies should always directly relate and correspond to the underlying claims. But of course, there are many problems with this, as we uh, discussed, for instance, in the case of trade secrets or other cases where maybe an extraterritorial remedy is necessary to prevent future infringements. Another one is to sort of work backwards and um, say, well, whatever the resultant remedies should be, let's narrow the claims or broaden the claims based on that. But of course, there is again a lot of uh, hurdles to the plaintiffs in uh, regards of how broad the claims uh, really can be, even from practical perspective. And finally, um, the way we see things at least happening now is hoping that these discrepancy problems can be addressed in individual cases um, as they arise. There is currently no national legislation and no international treaty to address the territorial discrepancy. In intellectual property law, we might see an interesting development if ever a WTO panel gets to decide a case that was raised by the European Union against China. And it is the case that concerns standard essential patents and friend licenses. Um, the academic projects such as the American Law Institute principles or the um, International Law Association guidelines for transnational IP cases don't really give us much in terms of what we should think about uh, the discrepancy of um, claims and remedies, but perhaps future reiterations of those projects might address these uh, problems. Um, and again, we might see some really interesting solutions as for instance, geoblocking becomes more of an accepted solution uh, to enforcement 
of rights on the internet. So thank you very much for your attention and I will welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Tribble. That was extremely interesting and I'm sure that all participants, they enjoyed the presentation. I would like to invite them. I don't see as far as I'm concerned any questions posted on q and but we are open and we are willing to address any question. Um, while waiting for that, um, um, if I'm allowed, I would like, ah, uh, yes, I would give the floor first as it was the continuation of your speech. Professor Svatleton, I'm going to give you the floor for a question on that presentation. Please, you have the floor. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, Marketa, for a, a wonderful presentation, as always. My question is, just so I understood it, looking at Equistec, for example, the remedy was global. Wasn't the claim in a sense also, or how, how do you define the claim as being different to the outcome there? What was the claim as you see it, if there is a discrepancy between the claim and the resulting remedy? If I recall correctly, the claim there was under Canadian law for trademark and trade secrets infringement. So again, the global nature of the remedy there actually made sense uh, from the trade secrets perspective where uh, the idea is to prevent the goods uh, that were built with those trade secrets from being sold everywhere. I guess the theory being that they could assist someone in reverse engineering the trade secret faster than otherwise. Um, so that would be an example of the discrepancy where the, the resulting remedy would be global and yet the claim brought before the court is actually local. But again, based on the fact that it includes trade secrets, it's quite understandable. And the Hatronic case in the United States is very interesting because of course, these days with sales being online, you really have to wonder how a sale of a trademark good in one country might affect another. In the Hatronic case, for instance, some of these goods were sold apparently outside the United States, but the agreement, the contract of sales included a provision that the Austrian or German company warranted that the goods are approved for use in the United States. Um, so even though the sale was outside the United States, the contract suggested that the buyer was considering bringing it to the United States and using it there. Um, so that might be a little bit of a more complication that might again warrant a more extraterritorial remedy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I understand that also Professor Spidler would like to raise a question on the same issue. Please, you have the mm. floor. Yeah. <clears throat> Just a, a comment on Marketa, and thanks a lot for this really intriguing presentation. I think the Digital Single Market Directive uh, in Europe also raised a lot of questions concerning geo-blocking, especially concerning all these upload filters, articles in Article 17. And uh, perhaps you would like to extend that a little bit. And just a question going back to, to Dan, and, and, and sorry that we have not met here in Göttingen because Dan is also a really hardly welcome professor here in Göttingen in our special program. Uh, okay, but let's skip that. Um, just for you, Dan, um, you have not talked about this Austrian politi politician case, this Glavishnik Pishnik uh, of the European Court of Justice, and they granted there a global, a global injunction concerning defamation. Perhaps you may comment on that a little bit more. Yes, thank you. I, I get um, angry every time I think about that case, so I try to limit it in my presentations. Yeah, so the background there was, <laughs> the background there, uh, uh, thanks for the question, uh, it involved uh, an Austrian politician who in the end got an order um, to have both current postings removed from a global perspective and future postings, repostings of similar contents, broader than the actual content, uh, blocked for the future. Um, it, it is an extraordinarily broad order. Uh, it is certainly not in line with um, 
balancing between freedom of expression and other rights in other countries. So my argument there would have been that that is a good example where we should not have a, a global order. It should be at the maximum EU-wide. What is interesting is that at the same time as the court gave this a global order with a little caveat of saying it's up to the national court to deal with it and it has to comply with international law. Well, we all know that international law says whatever we wanted to say on most of these matters. So that was not a very strong restriction. Uh, at the same time as that was happening, there was the uh, Google Kirill case where um, where the court limited the order to the EU-wide only uh, due to the um, circumstances there. I think that they certainly, in a, in a matter like we're talking about um, rights that are not even harmonized within the European Union, the court should have been much more careful in, in how it structured that order and dealt properly with the scope of a jurisdiction issue. The court ignored it completely. The Advocate General went into it in some detail. Uh, I respect the Advocate General a lot, but we don't fully agree on some matters there. I, I won't go on further, but I could talk about this uh, until it's breakfast time here. But, uh, for, hopefully we get the time to sit down and discuss it in Göttingen sometime soon. Uh, I think you had a question for Maketa as well. Thank you. Uh, I always think that people don't want to discuss the Glavishnik case because nobody can pronounce the name, but uh, that might be part of it. Uh, so thank you for your question about the EU Digital Single Market uh, Directive and Article 17. Unfortunately, no longer Article 13. I wish the, the original numbering state uh, there. Um, so, of course, geoblocking within the European Union is getting more complicated with the anti-geoblocking regulation. Uh, the new 2022 vertical restraints regulation and direct and um, guidelines, I think it's called, um, uh, didn't make things much more easier and actually seem to just complicate matters also for the perspective of personal jurisdiction and targeting issues, which is very interesting. Um, so that's that's part of the EU sort of uh, internal uh, part of that. Um, the Digital Single Market Directive and its overlap with the anti-geoblocking regulation, of course, is interesting uh, for similar reasons, which is um, the Digital Single Market Directive Article 17 focuses on copyright, while copyright um, and geoblocking imposed for copyright reasons is excluded from the anti-geoblocking regulation. And yet, undeniably, there will be a lot of content that will not be solely uh, copyright content. So there might be content that will end up being blocked for other reasons. There might be content under the DSM directive that will end up blocked for copyright reasons and yet not be solely that. Uh, so that will be a very complicated issue. I'm actually working on a book on geoblocking. So things uh, from that perspective are getting even more complicated uh, than, uh, than they were before I started working on the book. So thank you for your question. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think that's totally true. So we will really be waiting for your book. Yeah. So thanks a lot, Marquita. Thank you, Professor. I had to join you on the same question. I understand it's a quite complicated issue, the geoblocking. So we will be waiting for your next presentation. But for the time being, there is already a question on the Q&A platform. Uh, first of all, with congratulations for your great presentation. Uh, I understand, uh, sorry for the pronunciation of the name, for uh, Mr. Salamonovic. There is a proposal uh, in EU, a recent proposal of regulation on standard essential patents and the European Union Intellectual Property Office shall conduct a procedure for the amicable settlement of disputes related to fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory nature of terms and conditions. What do you think about its potential global scope of this new proposal? For Professor Keta, thank you. Thank you for the question and for the comment. Yes, um, I don't think that we should be surprised that the European Union is seeking uh, some uh, form of uh, solution, a way of addressing these kinds of disputes the 
international judicial competition in this space, the competition among courts in the UK, the US, China, and we know that some German, French uh, decisions suggest that maybe courts in other countries will be interested in weighing in and compete on this um, matter, uh, clearly show that there is a lot of interest. Uh, if the industry itself cannot really address this effectively, I don't think it's a surprise that there will be attempts uh, by various jurisdictions uh, to assist in addressing these kinds of disputes. And again, there is the EU case against China in the WTO, uh, raising, among other things, also provisions under the TRIPS agreement, under the uh, International Agreement on Intellectual Property Rights, about perhaps China violating uh, this type of agreement by asserting global jurisdiction over these types of disputes. Um, so we will see, undeniably, there must be some kind of solution that the industry can work with, uh, but perhaps it should be the industry itself uh, coming up with some kind of solution. Thank you very much, Professor. I would add, but we can leave it for the end of the discussion, two very short questions. In fact, the Lege Ferenta. Uh, if you think that the global scope would uh, depend on the nature of the remedy, it would be more easily to accept for injunctions uh, instead of damages award. And my second question relates to the, to the difficulty related to the, the evidence, as you rightly pointed at the beginning. So uh, would you agree uh, for, um, as we did it for competition law claims, for an estimation of damages or uh, to have a lower standard of proof? But I don't want to delay further the discussion. If you are willing to discuss that at the end, as you wish, or if you want, we do it like this. Okay, excellent. Then we proceed to our next speaker, Professor Spiedler. Well, we are already heard um, by Professor Arvanitakis how closely related it is to our academia. And we are very honored to have him with us. He's the author of more than uh, 100 articles in law reviews, as well as expert legal opinions. And he's the editor of one of the most renowned German law reviews concerning cyberspace law and telecommunication law. I understand as famous as the Lexan Forum in Greece. So we are very much happy to uh, attend his speech on uh, EU Digital Services Act and the EU Digital Markets Act mm. and its impact on private international law. Professor Spiedlet, yep. you have the floor. Yes. Thanks, Leo, for this kind in, uh, introduction and uh, also to Paris that we really meet again, or at least virtually. We have done a lot of studies, my butt, but way back then, 40 years ago. And also very nice to see Marquita and Dan here once again. Okay, I, I think I committed a big mistake when I opted for this topic because it turned out uh, that speaking after Dan and Marquita would be quite difficult for me. And on the other hand, uh, the topic is such a complex issue that uh, these eight slides, which will follow now, are absolutely insufficient. So I just really want to apologize to my auditorium if something is really missing. Uh, we can extend every kind of aspect in, in the discussion to come. So I'm speaking of you know, the Digital Service Act and the EU Digital Markets Act, impact on private international law, and uh, in particularly in the perspective of copyright law. So if we going to start, so a little bit, let's say, talks or thoughts about the background of all this kind of regulation. First, um, the European Union have seen the need for regulation and reform regarding the Digital Service Act because the formally uh, adopted e-commerce directive, which stemmed from 2000, um, seemed to be totally outdated concerning liability privileges. Why? Because business models, they have changed so much. Um, you have this... Uh, you know, these new business models like Facebook or whatever, Google also really had um, come into being when the e-commerce directive already had been, let's say, more or less on, on the road to be adopted and everything have changed totally. Uh, so we are confronted today with a phenomenon of very large online platforms of gatekeepers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
On the other hand, we have these new phenomena such as hate speech and fake news and every kind of disinformation, what we're all used uh, to know. So there was in particularly a need for regulation concerning the e-commerce directive to update it, to adopt it to these new business models and to this new phenomena and kind of mobbing and defamation, etc. Also, on the other hand, uh, we have seen at the European Union at the level also a need for regulation and reform regarding the Digital Markets Act, because we are here confronted with the role of gatekeepers in the platform economy. Um, all these network effects, uh, like positive or negative externalities, more or less positive externalities, have changed the landscape and the competition area so much that we are really um, needed such a reform um, with regard to the Digital Markets Act, to the introduction of the Digital Markets Act, because it turned out that the traditional um, anti or let's say competitive uh, competition provisions in the or Europe. European Union uh, was not really adequate anymore. Um, moreover, this DMA sought or seeks uh, to access or to give free access to data and to sharing data, which is to uh, just nowadays being accompanied by this new proposal of the European Data Act, but which has to be separated from the DMA. The DMA just concentrates on really gatekeepers and very powerful platforms. Uh, as well as search engines and everything that you can imagine, which is quite relevant as being a gatekeeper and the new economy. Um, the EU Data Act on the other side concentrates more on the access to data itself on aggregated data. So giving, for example, second stage business models a, or follow up business models, um, a right to access all this data. So it's a little bit overlapping, but it addresses different issues. Third, the DMA also addresses the prohibition of misuse of power regarding third parties on platforms. For example, we had some cases concerning Amazon marketplaces, which downgraded traders or which tried to exclude traders, which were not complying to the interoperability standards of Amazon, or which not um, followed all these reputational standards, which had been established by Amazon marketplace. So this had been more or less, let's say, the blueprints um, for the regulation or the need for regulation of the Digital Markets Act. So this is just the background, the setting. So what has that to do with the conflict of law of issues? Well, first of all, both acts are using the, well, you may say, traditional marketplace approach, or you may deem it a little bit negative as it is nowadays in the discussion uh, on the European level, if it's a positive or negative approach, more or less. So you have it in the article two, subparagraph one in the Digital Service Act that every service which is directed uh, to the European Union and which is probably affecting European citizens, then it's uh, very likely that the Digital Service Act would apply to these services. Um, even though um, the operator is being located in California, Singapore, or wherever, the Digital Service Act would apply to them. Um, the same approach is being used by the Digital Markets Act. It's also marketplaces, which is more or less logically following the traditional um, doctrines in anti-competition law and antitrust law. Now, because there we have ever used this marketplaces approach, wherever competition is being negatively affected, then these antitrust laws should apply. So this is more traditional approach in contrast to the Digital Service Act. However, um, in the GDPR um, concerning data protection, we already have seen the outcome um, of this marketplace approach regarding data protection. And going even further beyond the European Court of Justice, the famous decisions in Google Spain, which already have been mentioned uh, by Dan and also Google versus CNIL, they also used um, under this data protection directive, the same approach. So wherever a service is affecting European citizens, is affecting data protection, etc., then the European law comes into play. 
So what is then to say, what is that these services offer to recipients? Um, well, first of all, if the recipients are established or located in the UA in, in the European Union, that goes without saying, but what is then a substantial connection to the union? And this is more or less specified in Article 3E of the Digital, Signal, um, uh, of the Digital um, uh, Services Act, which first results either from their establishment in the EU or from the number of European users or the targeting of one or more EU member states. And this targeting is, let's say, the one or the crucial element in, for uh, the application of the law of the jurisdiction um, here in what we're discussing about. So what is then the targeting? Here, the European Court of Justice uses more or less in the marketplace approaches cases, the same approach which he used in the consumer protection cases, like in PAMR. Yeah. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the European Court of Justice cases know what I'm referring to is Article 6 of the Rome 1 regulation, and there the European Court of Justice developed this kind of targeting of a website to a consumer. Now, this uh, just started with these PAMR um, cases. So, wherever we have a certain substantial number of citizens in the European Union to which potentially such a service could be addressed, then already the Digital Service Act will step into and should be considered, let's say, by the business what we are talking about. But there are still a lot of gaps that are existing um, because the Digital Service Act um, seems to address all issues what we are dis discussing about seems to be a complete regulation of risk management of hate speech and everything which you can really think of and just to give you one example i think it is article 16 or so concerning um, um uh, the management system of complaints it consists of more than nine or ten subparagraphs uh, establishing such a really huge administrative monster if i'm allowed how to name it in that way, um, that is really somehow difficult really to apply. It's not really short, like in the e-commerce directive, but it's really trying to cover at least everything which you can think about. However, only in these sectors. So it is not a complete regime regarding jurisdiction, not at all. Um, and just to give you an example, liability of a platform, for example, for a defamation post, what Dan already referred to, it still depends on the illegality of this post, which is then governed by national conflict of laws, because Rome 2 regulation, even inside the European Union, is not applicable to personality rights and not to moral rights, not at all. So it's just up to the national conflict of laws regime how to treat and how to qualify or assess the illegality of such a post. And the liability of the provider then depends upon the illegality of the post. Even though then the Digital Service Act would apply to, in theory, to all these liability issues of providers, it still depends on national conflict of laws, how you're going to treat in the end um, the liability of the provider, because everything depends upon the leg legality of the post, which Dan already mentioned before. Moreover, um, we are confronted, confronted with a more public law approach regarding obligations of these online platforms. If you just have a look um, on Article 34 uh, sequentially of the Digital Service Act, you will see that there are a lot of risk management obligations, risk management system, which are taken more or less literally out of the financial market obligations, which had been introduced way back then, 2009, 2010, 12, etc., in order to mitigate all these financial market risks. And so that was the blueprint here for the Digital Service Act, uh, also to introduce these risk management system, which should mitigate the risk of uh, 
deformation of uh, wrong or fake news, etc., which may affect then democracy procedures, elections, etc., human rights. It's really very, very broad categories, a very, very broad catalogs, catalogs um, of risks that are being addressed here in the Digital Service Act. However, this is just public law, which then has to be enforced by authorities. Um, it has nothing to do with civil law. And for that reason, we really have to distinguish all these kind of civil law obligations or which may result perhaps in a secondary stage of all these public law regulations. We really have to distinguish that from the very um, first stage or the first level or layer of all these obligations established in Article 34 subsequently of the Digital Service Act, which is more or less centered around all these very large online platforms and all these supervisory structures. So, and to render things even more complicated, well, we still have a, an article um, in this DSA, in this Digital Service Act, which tells us that Article 3, subparagraph 2 of the e-commerce directive, the so-called country of origin principle, should be left untouched. However, the wording is totally opaque, yeah? because first the Commission wanted to state it like that, should be left untouched, but now it's been stated that this regulation shall not affect the application of the directive, of the e-commerce directive, and thus it should not affect the application of the country of origin principle. But this is, however, contradicted by the recital 38 of the Digital Service Act, which is totally nebulous, because this recital states that every kind of action, being in a court injunction or be it an authority which issues such an injunction, that should not be deemed um, concerning something like outside of this Article 3, uh, subparagraph 2 of the e-commerce directive. So, in fact, this is the death. This is really the death, the death of the country of origin principle, because uh, call concerning defamation, every kind of injunction which is issued by a court or authority should not be assessed by this country of origin principle should not be assessed by the jurisdiction, which then should be called applicable under this country of origin principle. I know that the E-date decision um, of the European Court of Justice has not qualified this country of origin principle as being a rule of conflict of laws. However, in fact, it, it turns out to be more or less a little bit like a conflict of laws rule. However, this recital 38 now declares it totally inapplicable for the most, let's say, the most, yeah, for the most of, of the cases which are relevant um, concerning this country of origin principle and, and defamation rules. So now coming more to the center of our talks, the relationship to copyright. And here we are confronted um, once again with these uh, opaque formulations in the Digital Service Act. It just declares that the Digital Single Market Directive DSM should be untouched by the Digital Single, uh, the Digital Service Act. Uh, this is Article 2, subparagraph 4B of the DSA. However, what does that mean, untouched, being left untouched? So should it be modified or not, and in what sense, et cetera? Because if we have a closer look at the DSA, um, then we will see that there are a lot of provisions which touches the Digital Single Markets Directive. It starts with Article 3H of the DSA, um, defining in a very, very broad way illegal content, also encompassing everything like copyright infringements, personal rights, everything you can imagine. So Article 3H just refers to an infringement of provisions which are enshrined in the European Union law. That's it. So DSM directive, everything in copyright should be covered by this definition under this Article 3H of the DSA. 
So what is then here at stakes? If, if we look a little bit uh, concerning the requirements of notifications, they are very, very specific in Article 16, subparagraph 2 and 3 of the DSA, and they are quite more specific than in Article 17 of the DSM directive. So should we then conclude that all this regime of notification of the DSA is just left outside because there's this DSM directive, which should be left untouched by the DSA or not? Um, the prevailing opinion uh, right now in Germany mm, is more or less a little bit hesitating um, to the priority of the DSM directive. They are more in favor, and I think that's rightfully so, to apply all the specific uh, requirements concerning notification, yeah? because that's already addressing all kinds of legal content. Further on, and it's just, just some examples, and you really can extend it across the DSA, you have dispute resolution mechanisms, which are really, really very, very um, detailed in this Article 21. I think they encompass more than 10 or 11 subparagraphs. And they, for that reason, they're absolutely much more specific than Article 17, subparagraph 9 of the DSM directive, which is just... Um, obliging a provider to establish something like an online dispute resolution mechanism. But that's it. Um, but here, Article 20, uh, 21 goes even that, this far in declaring um, who has to bear the cost if he would lose a case, for example, in such an online procedure, in such an online dispute resolution mechanism. And so absolutely far more specific than this Article 17.9 of this DSM directive on that. For that reason, I think there are good arguments um, to, uh, or to argue that the Article 21, for example, DSA here really is more specific, is more lax specialist to this DSM directive and thus has to be applied. So final slide, and then you're going to be relieved. Um, Unfortunately, there's absolutely no conflict of laws rule in the DSM directive, nothing which, to which Marquita, for example, has referred to, territoriality principle, et cetera, that's totally left untouched, totally left to member states. And it's, um, okay, it's also contained in the Rome regulation, but everything else, nothing at all in the DSM directive where you should expect it. And not more, and even not more in the Information Society Copyright Directive of 2001, but it should have been there in the DSM directive because, well, the European Union had been totally aware of all these problems of geo-blocking, et cetera, what Marquita has told about that, as has uh, given her presentation. So Article 8, um, subparagraph 2 of the Rome 2 regulation still applies. It's still the country of protection, territoriality. And of course, there are a lot of overlaps between the DSA and the DSM directive. And this may result in, in a conflict concerning conflict of laws. For example, given all this dispute resolution. So the, you may end up in telling people, hey, you have an online dispute resolution mechanism according to Article 17.9 DSM directive, according to the principle of territoriality. But on the other side, you're using this marketplace approach, which may result in, in different cases. But we don't have any cases yet. So it is a little bit of theoret of theory, which I am told you about, which I had been here um, yeah, presenting. But I think this may be some dynamite concerning conflict of laws and regarding um, intellectual uh, property rights and, and, and copyright here, because there is a huge overlapping between the DSA um, and uh, the DSM directive, and of course also DMA, but not as much as the DSA. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I welcome any kind of questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. We don't feel relieved, we feel grateful. I think that Marketa has already a question and then Professor Svasteson also. 
And there is a question on the Q&A platform, but it relates generally the copyright infringement. So perhaps we will ask, we'll ask it at the end after Mr. Evolidi's presentation also. So please, Marketa, you have the floor. Thank you, Leah. Uh, wonderful overview of the DSA issues. And it's great to know that there is a dynamite issue in conflict of laws. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a general question, which is, uh, of course, we see this incredible effect of the internet, of the cyberspace on the law, and the EU producing all this new legislation that concerns or is internet specific. Uh, but we also have the opposite effect, which is how the law is shaping the internet, and certainly the evolution of geoblocking is one sign of it. So I would like uh, to ask uh, what you can foresee as the effects of the DSA on the on the internet in terms of um, how businesses might structure their activities on the internet. And there are two particular things that I wonder about. One is the targeting issue. Um, so we now have rules really concerning targeting in the DSA, in the anti-geoblocking regulation, in now in the 2022 vertical restraints regulation in the area of competition law. And yet we have also national courts and the Court of Justice of the European Union using targeting factors when they decide about uh, jurisdiction. So that's one thing how I, you know, what the DSA will do in terms of how companies will approach targeting when they have all these different pieces. And the other one is the size of the enterprise. So the DSA has different rules for the super large and smaller. Do you think it's possible that companies will aim to sort of uh, structure their business in multiple layers, multiple tiers to avoid the strictest rules under the DSA? Yeah, thank you. As always, good questions. Um, of course, I think there will be this so-called Brussels effect of this DSA. And we already have noticed that uh, during the introduction of the GDPR, because first it had been deemed as something, well, 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 let the Europeans do whatever they want. Nobody would care after all. But in effect, it turned out that it really had a very, very deep effect upon what do I know, every kind of states around the globe and even concerning the US. Um, so for that reason, I think the Digital Service Act will have an impact, uh, will have a really deep impact because it's one of the first regulations, as far as I know, concerning all these kind of networks, et cetera. And as far as I know, but please correct me, Marketa, you're nearer to that. I think also US Congress has taken a lot of notice what is going on in, in the European Union. Um, we're not talking about AI, but also Digital Service Act. Huh? Um, so I think there, even though we may struggle, let's say, with these supervisory authorities, because, well, this is just overwhelming, let's say, the state all, you know, you, you, know, you need manpower to enforce it, etc. And where do you get you know, these manpower really capable um, to really enforce and to supervise all these kind of codes? And what do I know? This is, but this is just a problem on its own. But the GDPR has shown us um, that there is at least an effect. Uh, and, and for that reason, this targeting approach is so important. And I think they will draw, let's say, the criteria from this consumer directive or this consumer regulation uh, criteria. I think they are quite similar here. And this is just a common approach with this marketplace approach. What you can really, um, yeah. But you can really see what is happening in, in practice. Um, the second question related to reactions of enterprise, if they would try to, to stagger, let's say, uh, their number. Um, yeah, of course, that may be the case. Um, on the other hand, um, to be honest, I think this Article 34 is sequential um, and, and, and the following of these DSA, they really have been targeted to enterprises like Facebook, um, Apple, et cetera, which cannot really evade um, all this kind of regulation. So it's not been targeted at medium enterprises. And there are, for, of course, there are uh, exceptions to that in the Digital Service Act. And, and even though, if uh, even, even if we're talking, for example, of, concerning only regulation of the online platforms, there you already have some exceptions concerning small and medium-sized enterprises. 
So maybe there will be some kind of staggering concerning the enterprises. And, but on the other hand, you have also to think about um, the tendencies of the European courts um, concerning uh, the, how should I say, the allocation of numbers. So um, if, if you're just going to spread or if you're just going to split up your companies in, in order to avoid you know, all these kind of numbers, I think there will be some sort of anti-movement in the courts and just trying to in, invent something in order to assign all these numbers to just one company. Yeah, so that there will be no real leeway to avoid, let's say, the application um, of all these articles. Yeah, so, sorry for this nebulous and opaque answer, but... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Dan, please, could you raise your question? Yes, thank you. Great. I, I must admit I tried to avoid the these new instruments because I found them confusing, uh, but now I learned a lot. Uh, so thank you so much for that overview. My question is partly already answered by you, Gail. They, in, it related to, we've seen with GDPR that EU law has had a tremendous impact without almost, well, I would say without any enforcement actions abroad, right? So it's almost like a a successful bank robbery without a, go a shot being fired. No enforcement has been taken and still the impact has been uh, achieved. Do you think we'll see the same here or is uh, are there aspects of these new instruments that make it harder to get the international community on board in this direction? Well, as, as I already pointed out uh, in my answer to Marquita, I think uh, it will have an impact and really a huge impact because um, all these, um, how you call it in English, come on, help me, uh, Bußgelder, these uh, penal uh, or these monetary sanctions, uh, which, which can be uh, ordered uh, to companies, they really would have a severe in, uh, impact. Uh, just look at this Kugel Kneel case, which you yourself re referred to. I think they ordered to Google 6%, uh, up to 300, what do I know, billions of euros uh, concerning um, the monetary sanctions. Uh, well, it is an administrative law, but nevertheless, uh, it has really very, very severe impact. So, um, well, we, we can argue that then internet companies will avoid the European Union market, but I would not guess so now, because that's still too huge and still too important uh, for the big tech companies um, that they cannot really afford to avoid the whole European Union market. So every kind of these sanctions, um, which can be brought them, uh, please keep that in mind, globally turn over globally turn over the whole group of companies that is to say all alpha alphabet globally turnover will be taken as a base for calculating the six percent um, and this is really quite a huge number um, and for that reason i think it might be it may turn out to be very very effective and um, as i said this is this famous brussels effect thank you Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yeah, Evolivis, okay. you are eager to, to ask a question or to proceed with your presentation? To ask a question. Go, please, <laughs> go on. Can wait. <laughs> please, please. You have the a very quick one. Professor Spindler, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Uh, you mentioned the overlaps between the DSA and mm -hmm. the DSA Act and the DSM Directive. Mm -hmm. And in view of that, I would just like your opinion on whether maybe the legislator with Article 17 of the DSM directive might have overshot it a bit and involved himself in issues that would in any case be regulated either by the Electronic Commerce Directive or the upcoming DSA Act. Personally, I understand that partially Article 17 was necessary because it clarifies in terms of EU law the issue of whether platforms commit an unlawful communication to the public or not, which is now clarified by Article 17 one way or the other. But when it comes to uh, the duties of the platforms, the injunctions in the SATs, I always felt that this is the traditional scope of the Electronic Commerce Directive slash the DSA. This is why my question on whether 
you would share the opinion that maybe the legislator oversaw the debate with Article 17. <sighs> That's really a very provocative question now you pose. Um, well, first of all, well, as, as you know, the DSM directive really had been heatedly debated uh, in the European Parliament, etc. And it stemmed from a different uh, um, DG uh, in the European Commission than the DSA. Um, the DSA was more funded upon a broader consensus uh, than the DSM directive uh, because, well, you, it had not dealt with any kind of upload filters, etc. So just more or less indirectly. Um, yeah, I, I would agree to your opinion that the um, EU legislator here has really overshot a little bit in, in the DSM directive, but this is my personal opinion because I also um, pleaded for that during the European Court of Justice um, procedures. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just prepared this legal expertise for the Greens, I have to admit, um, where I've argued that the DSM Directive Article 17 is out of the scope concerning uh, the fundamental rights yeah, and these upload filters. But this is another story. Now, European Court of Justice has now adopted, uh, has now had let it pass um, this Article 17 of the DSM Directive. How? On, but on the other hand, if you read it carefully, this decision, it just left, let's say, the decision to the national courts. So, and they have them to check if all these national provisions in implementing this Article 17 are really in compliance with the standards being established by the European Court of Justice. And I'm really wondering if the French and Dutch implementation would really pass this test. Okay, but this is another story. Um, but I just have to admit that from to, to my mind has really had been totally overshot. And it was absolutely not um, in coordinating in coordination with this Digital Service Act, because there had been different political competences. I had been involved a little bit in this whole procedure, and I, I just can tell it to you like that. I, I, hopefully, that answers a little bit your question. Absolutely. And it reminds me that it will be up to the academics and courts now to find a way to coordinate the two provisions effectively. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I guess the commission thinks that we're not busy enough, I guess. Uh, yeah, but there is a little yeah. bit more room for extra work. Yeah, it, there is, there is, of course. And uh, yeah, concerning the wording uh, of the DSA, as, as I tried to point out, it was really deliberately chosen this word left untouched. Uh, what what does that mean? Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, or implication? Uh, this is so nebulous, but this was really being chosen deliberately. Uh, uh, it was a form of political compromise out of this trilogue uh, procedure with this Council of Member States. And I don't recall who has introduced it. Well, I think it was had been the French you know, that they just proposed this kind of compromise and then finally had been adopted in order to get it through. You know? And so, yeah. Uh, Professor Stiegler, <laughs> there is also another question for you, if yes. I'm allowed so, yeah. by Miss Irini Tikrika. Congratulations on your presentation. My question is on a possible effect of the DSA on the interpretation of Article 8, Paragraph 2 of the Rome 2 regulation. Mm -hmm. Whether this approach of territoriality could be influenced by the criterion of globality when it comes to the interpretation of the event giving rise to the damage, as the Court of Justice has already seemed willing to follow in its Nintendo decision. Mm. Ah, yeah. Um, if the DSA would be applicable in copyright law, as I tried to point it out, you know, so concerning all these overlaps, then of course we have this prevailing concept of the market approach, which is not the same as what you refer to the criterion of globality, um, because it's just if there's a market in the EU, then we should apply the DSA. But of course, this can, let's say, bypass this criterion of, or, or, or this concept of territoriality. No? I, I don't know if that answers your question. I suppose that uh, it will be welcomed by the, the participant who raised it. I mm -hmm. think that we have another question for the moment, uh, a last one regarding all the participants. So Irini mm -hmm. says it does. 
So thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. And so we could proceed to our last speaker, Dr. Revolidis. And uh, we would like to, uh, to share the opinion already expressed by Professor Arvanitakis on the qualities of the new Greek academic generation. Professor Revolidis will introduce the subject international jurisdiction over online copyright infringement. Dr. Revolidis, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I was trying to deflect attention from my presentation, but the time has arrived. So now I will have to offer it. I hope you can see my uh, slides. Uh, so I will, I will uh, redirect our attention a little bit away from platforms because what I will be referring to uh, returns us a little bit to peer-to-peer -peer copyright uh, disputes. Uh, uh, the focus is a little bit more to what uh, uh, users can do between themselves and not necessarily uh, how platforms are involved in that process. And uh, I will, my, my presentation will hover above three main topics. First, I will try to introduce a typology of online copyright disputes. Then I will discuss what is the current status quo on the European Union. And finally, I will reflect on the current uh, status quo. Starting with the typology of online copyright disputes, I think the starting point must be the right of the copyright holder. And as it's well known from general copyright theory, the copyright holder holds two sets of rights, moral rights and economic rights. And I think that for the typology and the jurisdiction of online uh, copyright disputes, this is important because Professor Banderson has already established in his excellent presentation that there is already national case law that seems to be treating moral rights differently than economic rights. If I'm not mistaken, in the Swedish uh, Supreme Court in the till then case treated moral rights more akin to the personality rights case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union and did not really draw from the other case law which I will introduce on the economic rights. And when we speak about economic rights, I would like to briefly remind that we mostly speak about, at least in terms of EU law, three uh, economic monopolies of the copyright holder, the right of reproduction, the right of distribution, and the right of communication to the public. All three of them can be infringed online, although in varying degrees. I would say that in the majority of cases, it would be the reproduction right and the right of communication to the public that would take the cake. As the right of distribution usually requires the work to be uh, inserted in some kind of tangible medium and tangible media uh, really circulate uh, around independently and not necessarily only online. Although, as I will explain during the Pinkney case, which is one of the major cases over uh, copyright uh, jurisdiction in the EU, the distribution right was also affected. Now, what are the available options according to the Brussels 1A regulation when we're trying to think where to litigate online copyright infringements? There are two obvious candidates for that. Article 4 of the Brussels 1A regulation, of course, the general jurisdiction of the domicile of the defendant, and of course, the other obvious candidate is Article 7, Paragraph 2, the place where the harmful event occurred or may occur. And to refresh a little bit our memories, traditionally the Court of Justice of the European Union, when it refers to Article 7, Paragraph 2, it says that in essence, this is a dual jurisdiction already because it opens up a window both at the place where the casual event took place, that is the illegal activity that gives rise to the damages, but also it's also the place where the damages uh, occur. And while all this is, of course, sounds easy in theory, it is interesting to see how things played out in reality. Uh, there are two crucial CZEU cases. There is the third one, the High Hotel, which I'm not mentioning here, and I'm not mentioning because High Hotel was mostly conducted offline. Uh, while the two cases that I have included in this slide, the Peter Pinkney and the Pes Haidu, are cases with digital elements. I would say Peter Pinkney had some digital elements, while Pes Haidu was more, uh, the, the, the digital elements were more manifest. Starting with the Peter Pinkney case, uh, by the way, uh, in case I will not receive any other questions, I promise to disclose which of the people pictured in this picture is actually Peter Pinkney, because indeed, this is a picture of the original band where Mr. Pinkney was a member. And this band, uh, from what I have read, what I have read, they used to play Beatles-like music. 
This is the best way I can describe it because I'm not really good at uh, music genres. And what really happened here is that there was a company in Austria which uh, found a vinyl copy of an album of Peter Pickney's uh, uh, group, and they compressed it in Austria in CDs. They then somehow sent these CDs to the United Kingdom, and they started distributing them from the United Kingdom using a UK website. I remind you that at the time, the United Kingdom was still a member state of the European Union, so it might have been a relevant jurisdictional place. Now, among the other, among the countries where the CDs were distributed, it was also France, the native country of Mr. Peter Pinkney, who was in fact able to buy on one, one of these CDs, and this is how he became aware of the violation. Now, Peter Pinkney brought an action against the Austrian company that compressed the CDs in France. And the question occurred whether France is the appropriate venue of jurisdiction, since first and foremost, it was not the domicile of the defendant, but most likely it could qualify as the place where the harmful event occurred. Now, the interesting part in this case is to be reminded a little bit about what Advocate General Yeskinen, Advocate General of the time, uh, proposed. Advocate General Yeskinen proposed that in this particular case where the infringement is occurring online by virtue of the fact that CDs are being distributed without the license of the copyright holders, she thought that it might make sense to borrow a little bit the targeting approach which is installed in Article 17 of the Brussels 1A regulation. This is, of course, the special consumer protection regime. And if I remember correct, uh, Advocate General Yaskin did not really suggest to apply Article 15, but he wanted to borrow the logic from that. He thought that the right of distribution in these circumstances was uh, infringed, probably, but the right of distribution has, so to speak, even over the internet, certain territorial connections depending on certain objective external indications that pinpoint which markets have been affected. It seems like the Court of Justice of the European Union was not particularly impressed. The Court of Justice, first and foremost, borrowed a little bit from its previous personality law, case law when it comes to jurisdiction, reminding us that in cases where we have infringements of personality rights by content plates online, actions can be brought in all member states where the content is merely accessible. And that is that was the starting point of the court's uh, decision, so to speak. The court also made some interesting thoughts uh, when it comes to the relationship of copyright with other intellectual property rights. Before the decision in Pinkney, the court had decided that trademarks can actually be infringed, damages can be sustained in, in, in trademarks only within the country where the trademark is registered. But the court was skeptical in applying the exact same philosophy on copyright because it acknowledged that although copyright is also susceptible to the principle of territoriality that governs IP rights, it offers a much more extensive surface of infringement by virtue of the fact that there is no official registration for copyright. Copyright is by default protected in all member states by virtue of the law applicable. And this is more or less where the court anchored the jurisdiction. It said that it is suffices that jurisdiction could lie with the country where copyright is actually protected, provided, of course, that the online representation of the infringing website was accessible in that particular uh, country. Also, the Court of Justice explicitly rejected the direction of activities approach that was suggested by Advocate uh, General Yeskinen. And of course, it also reminded us that in general, the jurisdiction of the countries where the content is accessible will be also limited in terms of scope because these courts will be only able to adjudicate over the dispute only to the extent of the damages that were suffered within their own territorial uh, borders. Now, I will come to the second case, which is the press hide case. And in this particular case, uh, what happened is that Mrs. Hyduk is a professional photographer who specializes in photographing uh, architectural constructions. 
And what Mrs. Hayek did is that she took a couple of professional photos from an architectural building and she licensed uh, their usage for an exhibition that would take place in Germany. But the company that received the license to exhibit the photos in the exhibition, they took it a step further. They uploaded uh, these photos in one of their websites. And it so happened that this website was also accessible in Austria, which allowed Mrs. Hyde to realize that they kind of overstepped the license that she had originally offered them. Now, the way Mrs. Hyde viewed the case was that while she could sue in Germany, where it is the domicile of the defendant, by virtue of the fact that the website was accessible in Austria, she could also sue in Austria in terms of Article 7, Paragraph 2 of the Process 1A regulation, uh, following up, of course, also what the court decided on Pinkney. And Ricky again drew had a different view on the case. Uh, they considered that, well, Germany could be a possible venue of jurisdiction, but not necessarily Austria, because they were not specifically targeting the Austrian market with their website. It was just a coincidence that the website was available there, so they were trying to scrap Austria as a possible jurisdictional venue. It's also interesting to remember how Advocate General Cruz Villayon viewed this case, because in this particular case, Advocate General Cruz Villayon made a very radical proposal, I would say. He said that, in essence, the extraterritorial infringement or the online, sorry, the online infringement of, of copyright by virtue of the fact of the immaterial nature of the right and also the global outreach of the internet renders the application of Article 7, Paragraph 2 of the Brussels 1A regulation impossible. And he, in fact, said, forget about Article 7, Paragraph 2. In such situations where, by definition, the content is available everywhere, Article 7, Paragraph 2 is completely negated, and we have to go back to the domicile of the defendant. Important, of course, in this equation is what the court thought about all that. Well, first and foremost, the court reiterated that copyright is automatically protected in all member states. And uh, therefore, copyright is capable of being infringed in all member states where they are protected. The court also reminded us that it does not want to adopt a targeting approach like the one proposed by Advocate General Yeskin and, and suggested by Energy Agentur in this particular case. But in essence, the court said that for the purposes of Article 7, Paragraph 2 of the Brussels 1A regulation, the expert of the decision that I use here refers to the old Article 5, Paragraph 3, but in reality is nowadays Article 7, Paragraph 2 of the Brussels 1A regulation. In essence, it said that international copyright infringements can be adjudicated before all the courts were the infringing content is merely accessible. So if I were to visualize how the court viewed the case, it would be the following picture. Uh, probably Mrs. Hayden would be able to sue all over the European Union because the website of Energia Gentur was accessible everywhere. And therefore, if we were to extend the reasoning of the court, the options for Mrs. Hayden now are plentiful. And therefore, there is a lot of, so to speak, leeway to design the litigation strategies. Now I would like to reflect a little bit on the current status quo, on what the court has said so far. And when I will try to reflect, I want to be fair. I understand that the ways to reflect on this decision are plentiful in the sense that each commentator applies different benchmarks in order to assess what the court has told us. So I believe I owe an explanation on what my benchmarks are going to be for reflecting on the decisions. And when reflecting on them, the basic ideas that I have in mind is the following. First and foremost, the Brussels 1A jurisdictional system is based on the principle of the protection of the rights of the defense. The default rule is that we go to the domicile of the defendant and that derogations from that rule must, must be interpreted in a restrictive manner. At the same time, uh, that does not necessarily mean that we must always favor the defendant. Another consideration that I will take into account is that according to the Brussels 1A regulation, the teleology of Article 7, which is the provision that we discuss right now, is to allow the dispute to be adjudicated before the courts that are best placed to do justice. And now, of course, there are several considerations to be taken into account here. 
Because this criterion, apart from procedural efficiency, in my opinion, tries to achieve another important target, which is a proper balance between the competing rights of the plaintiff and the defendant. And of course, because I mentioned procedural efficiency, that should also be taken into account when assessing what the court has presented us as a solution. Having said that, I think that the decisions come with advantages and disadvantages. The first advantage is that the Court of Justice of the European Union pays tribute to the principle of territoriality. And I say it is an advantage because up until that point, the Court of Justice of the European Union has told us that when judging jurisdiction on the basis of Article 7, Paragraph 2, we must take into account the particular nature of the right that is being infringed. And therefore, in that sense, the court is fair. A second probable advantage is that the way the court approaches the cases creates a coincidence of forum and applicable law. If we extend the logic of the court, in the case, for example, of Mrs. Heidel, she was able to sue in Austria, and Austrian law would be applicable by virtue of Article 8 of the Rome 2 regulation, which means that the Austrian courts would feel a little bit more comfortable dealing with the case since they would not have to refer to the foreign copyright law. And that sometimes come with its own, comes with its own benefits. Third, third, it simplifies access to justice for the copyright holder. Indeed, by not requiring the copyright holders to prove any substantial connection between the dispute and the adjudicating court, the Court of Justice of the European Union made it in a way easier for copyright holders now to find access to justice. But as I said, there are also disadvantages. First and foremost, while the court is fair when paying tribute to the principle of territoriality, I wonder, should the principle of territoriality be as decisive? Now, I don't want to provoke the anger of the colleagues that specialize in intellectual property law. I respect the principle of the territoriality and I understand uh, their emotions about it. But what I'm trying to say is that we know from previous cases of the Court of Justice of the European Union that while the particularities of the infringed rights must be taken into account, there is a certain limit to this approach. And that limit is that the law applicable is not supposed to be necessarily determining jurisdiction because there are two independent areas that serve independent purposes. And sometimes the fact that the law is applicable does not necessarily mean that the court of that particular country must have jurisdiction as well. I also would like to question a little bit whether a coincidence of the forum and the applicable law is always desirable. Of course, it comes with benefits. And when it happens, it is, uh, 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 let's say, a positive occasion in terms of private international law. But we again need to remember that the Court of Justice itself has, in several occasions, reminded us that it is not absolutely necessary that this will be happening. And of course, the last disadvantage that I would see is that the decisions of the court in Pingni and Haiduk, in large parts, replicate the mosaic approach of the Shevin case law. And again, while I have respect for the mosaic approach, and I will explain why in brief, I do realize that the mosaic approach comes with all kinds of different limitations. For example, it creates a huge multiplication of available fora. In the case of Haiduk, that would be the outcome. And that comes, of course, with disadvantages. First and foremost, for the copyright holder, in order to be able to collect the damages, they will have to split now their actions into 87 different member states. They don't have, other than the domicile of the defendant, the venue, where they can collect all their damages. The mosaic approach also creates problems with the scope of the remedies, which we have discussed a lot today. While it is fairly reasonable to limit compensation claims within the territorial limits of the country that has jurisdiction. We know for a fact that in copyright disputes, damages is not the only remedy. Sometimes copyright holders might want injunctions. And what we have learned from Bolasu Plinsingen is that courts with territorially limited jurisdiction might not necessarily be able to issue injunctions. Although it is a fair point, that mosaic, court, mosaic courts might be able to issue injunctions that are though valid only within the limits of their own uh, country.
But there is another dimension that I would like to point, and that is that the current approach of the court does not seem to be very fair to the teleology of Article 7. The teleology of the Article 7 is for the dispute to be adjudicated by the court that is most closely connected with the dispute. And I don't know whether courts of countries where infringing content is merely accessible are necessarily very close to uh, the dispute. Having said that, there is another dimension which I found very important. And that dimension is the problem of coordinating also the different mosaic proceedings. Uh, if, if we apply the best hybrid case law, a copyright holder can simultaneously sue in 27 different member states, which might create some kind of inconsistency between the judgments that are going to be issued. Because of course, the chances are that if 27 judges are asked the same question, they might not all agree on the outcome. Uh, there might be certain countries where an infringement will be established, where in other countries an infringement will not be established. And while this might appear as a cosmetic problem, it might turn out to be a very important problem, especially for the copyright holder, because of course, inconsistent judgments within the context of the Brussels 1A regulation is a problem to be addressed at the level of refusal of enforcement. It's one of the grounds that might lead to refusal of enforcement of the decisions achieved. In that sense, I have noticed that in the recent GT Flix case, Advocate General Hogan offered some interesting thoughts or some interesting thoughts in the problem of coordination of different mosaic proceedings. Of course, disclaimer, Advocate General Hogan spoke about personality infringements, but he was of the opinion that different mosaic personality cases are not necessarily introducing the same subject matter of this case. Why? Because each court is only limited to the infringement that happens in its own country, and they will definitely apply a different law. Now, these are interesting arguments, although they do uh, merit further scrutiny. For example, I'm really, really uh, struggling to see how different are all these disputes. If I translate that to uh, copyright law, let's, let's take the case of Press Hyduk, where her photos became available online via a German website. And this website is accessible in all 27 member states. If Ms. Heiduk decides to avail herself of the opportunity to sue in all 27 member states, we're going to have 27 parallel proceedings. And at the core of these proceedings, the factual elements of the case are going to be identical. It's going to be the exact same facts, more or less. At the same time, we're going to have the exact same litigant parties. And a thought which I borrow from another decision of the Court of Justice of the European Union, that is Eva Maria Piner, while we do subscribe by the principle of territoriality and different national laws are going to be applicable, copyright law has been unified at EU level. There are, of course, still discrepancies between the laws of the member states. But even the legal element of the case will not be as different as it is usually perceived. I mentioned the case of Eva Maria Piner because it refers to Article 8 of the Brussels 1A regulation, which introduces a possible mechanism of coordinating parallel proceedings. Albeit, the basic difference being that in Article 8, we require different legal patterns, while in the situation that I was describing, we have the same parts. But there is an interesting part on Article 8 of the Brussels 1A regulation. It says that proceedings that are similar factually between different litigant parties can be coordinated before the same court if they are so closely related that it might make sense from a procedural point of view to rule over them together. And when the Court of Justice approached that problem on Piner, it was on copyright grounds. And when the court was called in Piner to coordinate different copyright disputes between different litigant parties, it came to the conclusion that in view of the unification of copyright within the member states, that the factual and legal elements of copyright cases might deem them closely related. So what I, I, I dare suggest is that if we extend a little bit some of the thoughts in Piner to Article 30 of the Brussels 1A regulation, which is the article on related actions, 
it might to at least allow us indirectly coordinate the different proceedings that might occur in the 27 member states which the court of justice has opened up uh, to the discretion of course of the copyright holder now in all fairness i told my opinion on the decisions of the court and you might ask me do i have a better proposal than what the court did i would say partially should the court of justice abandon this current approach maybe yes maybe no what do i mean by that after the GDFLIX case I realized, especially from paragraph 39, that the court insists a lot on the mosaic principle in general, because it has a basic fear. The court seems to be afraid that if we adopt the unitary approach and we try to ditch the mosaic approach for a place where the damage is, so to speak, concentrate, we might not be able to identify such a place, especially in online infringements. And therefore, we might completely negate Article 7, paragraph 2. So in a way, the court seems to have a point when trying to defend the efficiency of Article 7, Paragraph 2. My main problem is that probably the court overstepped a little bit its intentions because by allowing disputes to be judged by courts uh, in countries where copyright infringing material is merely accessible, we might be undermining the basic philosophy of Article 7, Paragraph 2, which is a close connection between the dispute and the party. So, if I were to say, uh, is there any better alternative? Maybe the court might not have to completely abandon the mosaic approach, but the court might want to think whether it might make sense to improve the mosaic approach. Do not exclude the possibility that copyright cases could be adjudicated between multiple courts on the basis of Article 7, Paragraph 2, but at least limit the jurisdictional venue. Uh, limit the jurisdiction of venues to those member states that have an actual factual connection with the case. And there is a way to measure that. In legal literature, there have been proposed all kinds of criteria like the targeting test uh, or, or similar such criteria that might, might offer some kind of a solution. Having said that, these were my last comments. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very happy uh, to answer all questions, including who actually is Mr. Pickney in the photo that I included in the relevant slide? Thank you very much, Dr. Evolidis. As the time is flying, uh, I would like to give the floor, uh, if our panelists allow me, to pass first the floor to two questions that have been um, posted on the Q&A. First of all, for uh, from um, our uh, excellent colleague, Professor Anna Despotidou, a question addressed to Dr. Revolidis. Dear Dr. Revolidis, what exactly do you mean by drawing a difference between moral and economic rights that accrue from copyright? Because from a copyright point of view, the notion of infringement does not vary depending on the nature of the rights involved. And although moral rights have not been regulated at an EU level, they may very well be infringed by the acts of the users in the internet digital environment, in particular, the rights of paternity, integrity, et cetera. Indeed. So please. Thank Mr. you Mr. very much for the, for the question because it allows me to clarify something very important. Uh, when I said that we might see discrepancies, I do not question the fact that moral rights can be infringed online. Uh, definitely, they can be infringed online. What my concern here is the following. As I explained in terms of Article 7, Paragraph 2 of the Brussels 1A regulation, the applicable jurisdictional rules depend on the legal nature of the rights that are being infringed. Traditionally, moral rights are being uh, closer to personality rights than other economic copyrights. And if we extend this logic, which already happened in the till then case before the Swedish Supreme Court, it means that we might end up for the same uh, right, which is copyright to have different jurisdictional venues on moral rights because they will follow the personality case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union and different jurisdictional venues for the economic rights that will follow the Pinkney and Peshaitu uh, case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Which is a very, very interesting and provocative problem uh, already explained by Professor Svantesson in his presentation. And by the way, I'm tempted to ask him whether he agrees with the approach of the Swedish Supreme Court of treating moral rights more akin to personality rights and not to the economic rights of, of the copyright holder. I hope I answered uh, the question, Professor Desolini. 
Thank you, Dr. Evolidis. Professor Stavenson, normally the question follows to you. As it goes on, please, you have the floor. <laughs> that's, all, that's good. Thank you so much for the presentation, Ian. It's, it's fantastic. And, and this is a great question that was raised. So we are not there yet. I mean, it's only a, a decision by one member state, in this case, Sweden. Uh, but it is a decision by the Supreme Court of Sweden. So it has some influence there, where uh, the court then did split how it viewed the jurisdiction nature of moral rights compared to the economic rights associated with copyright. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think the court is right that moral rights are more similar to uh, personality rights than economic rights or associated with copyright. Having said that, we are going to end up with a double litigation in a sense or potential split litigation because you could go to various places for the moral rights where you couldn't necessarily litigate the economic rights. So I can see the problems in a practical perspective, but from a sort of what fits with what, I, I see the logic of a Swedish approach. I was going to ask, I had as one of my questions was to you, Ian, is, was, do you think that, uh, and this is, you can only speculate, of course, but do you think that the Court of Justice would agree with the Swedish Supreme Court in a, uh, similar circumstances? And that would be very interesting indeed. Uh, I, if I were to speculate, judging from what the court did on GT Flicks, I might be tempted to say yes, because the GT Flicks case was a competition law. But the Court of Justice of the European Union, for some reason, treated it as a personality infringement, which in a way kind of puts in question its previous behavior to discriminate on the basis of the legal nature of the rights. I, I, Advocate General Hogan repeated several times that the GD Flix is a competition law case. And she tried to apply competition law case logic, but the court would have none of it. The court uh, kind of completely forgot the competition element and so personality infringement. Uh, so, so maybe, maybe, I, I, I would not be uh, surprised. Although that would force the court to partially admit that at least some copyright disputes can be concentrated in a venue that would have full jurisdiction over the case, with something that the court has been avoiding in terms of copyright infringement, at least in Pinkney and Hyde. Which, by the way, this discussion, Professor Svanderson reminds me of the following. We have a tendency in the literature to treat personality rights and economic copyrights different because we believe that economic copyrights follow the principle of territoriality, while for some reason, personality rights, we, 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 we treat them as being global. But last time I checked, there is no global personality right in reality. What happens in a personality infringement is that the different member states will apply different personality laws. And I'm not even sure that all of them acknowledge personality rights. I can tell you that after spending some time in Malta, uh, Maltese law does not really talk about personality rights, or at least what we understand in civil law as personality rights. So I'm not really sure whether this dichotomy between copyright, territoriality, personality rights, some kind of a universal right, I'm not sure that this dichotomy is absolutely correct. And within these lines, I think that that might allow us to reflect more generally on, on how to treat the jurisdictional issues between the two. Thank you, Yanis. Professor Tribble, would you like to submit your question? Uh, I would love to, but maybe the question in the Q&A, uh, it follows. I leave it because it's a general for all panelists. So I think that in okay. a few minutes, we can conclude with that question, which uh, is addressed okay, so to all panelists, as you wish. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Ione. It's very, uh, very interesting. I have a question about the mosaic approach and the threat of 27 parallel litigations. Um, Apart from the question of practicability and how many plaintiffs can actually afford to litigate in 27 countries, um, law should work for extreme cases as well. So we might have a plaintiff who would go to 27 countries and certainly just the nuisance value of the lawsuits would be significant. But I wonder whether it seems like that the targeting approach, if I understand correctly, was left for choice of law. So it's not there anymore for specific jurisdiction. But as soon as a court of specific jurisdiction would take the case, uh, they would have to apply their own law. And for that, it seems like under the Rome regulation, they would have to 
look at targeting. So I wonder whether that would limit uh, the number of potential fora. And also going back actually to Professor Ananasio's uh, question, I wonder you know, when the case goes on, uh, accessibility alone will not do. I mean, the court will probably not award any damages, even statutory damages, without some evidence of actual infringement. So again, I don't want to discount the nuisance value and the defendant having to face 27 lawsuits, but I wonder whether we should perhaps worry about it less in practice. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that is a very valid observation. Thank you, Professor Dimbo. And I agree with you that the merits of the case might rationalize a little bit the final outcomes in the different member states. Having said that, first and foremost, if somebody has the economic depth to sue in all 27, and some copyright holders might be able, that might mean that the defendant might not appear in all 27 member states. So more than the merits of the case, it will become an issue of how individual procedural laws deal with the absence of the defendant. And I can tell you, for example, that in Greece, we have a rather strict regime. If the defendant is not present, they deem to lose on the merits of the case, and they're going to lose one instance of, of justice, so to speak. Uh, also, also, of course, um, it is interesting because what you just explained, it was used by the court as an argument on not to make this assessment at the jurisdictional level. But I wonder, is it this the first time in legal terms that the same set of facts can have both procedural and substantive law consequences? Because in, in other phenomena that happens, and, and I believe that it could somehow help rationalize the jurisdictional level to even remove the temptation of, of going as far. And of course, at the level of coordinating the different uh, proceedings, while we might objectively make an assessment on whether a court will indeed fight, find an infringement or not. Are we always certain on the preamble? Because what we assess beforehand as a defendant might not turn out to play as such before a judge. The judge might find a minimal contact, but he might nonetheless still be satisfied that enough was done for infringement to be found in this country. I, I understand, of course, that we need to always think of a rational judge, but sometimes but sometimes it might make uh, sense even for the sake of argument to think that it might go wrong on that way as well. Thank, Thank you, Jan. Uh, we have two more questions. In fact, um, uh, one from Ms. Lydia Lundstedt. Uh, she points out that if she remembers well the Swedish case, the claimant limited its damages to Sweden. So the Supreme Court statement on moral rights is arguably obiter dicta. It would have been significant for the outcome of the case. Do you think that the Supreme Court should have referred the question to the European Court of Justice? Quite interesting uh, question. I'll, I mean, Yanis might want to add to that too, but yes, it, it is. You can see it that way because the, it's true that the claim was limited to damage happening in Sweden. But but it's still a fact that the court, in relation to moral, moral rights, based its jurisdictional analysis on the edate reasoning. So I would not necessarily say that it is an obiter. It used different grounds for finding jurisdiction for the economic rights and for the moral rights. So that, I think, is the is core of a decision. Should they have referred it to uh, the um, Court of Justice, probably would have made it more interesting. Um, but but I can see why they didn't, since it they saw it then as uh, obviously in line with a, such a previously, so just a recently decided case, perhaps. Thank you, and I will proceed with the last question, as far as I can see. And I think uh, Yuri Karlas, for his her patience, uh, maybe this question is out of the context of the presentation. Still, I believe it's food for thought. I wonder what panelists think of the idea of treating computer programs as information due to their immaterial nature, as well as information has unlike its carriers. The issue here is about the freedom of use of information and its conflict with copyright. 
So I wonder if any of the panelists would like to take the floor of that more general question. Yes, Professor Tribble. Uh, thank you. Uh, on the question of uh, treating copyright to computer programs uh, differently, or maybe even abolish uh, copyright on computer programs, of course, it would be maybe difficult because we have now two international treaties that mandate that countries provide copyright protection for computer programs. Um, but on the general topic of treating the intangible uh, of the computer program differently, I would just urge uh, uh, the, the questioner to look up uh, the US Supreme Court decision in Microsoft versus AT&T, uh, which is a very interesting case where the justices talked about precisely sort of uh, decoupling the intangible and the tangible code um, in a way that sounds very 19th century like. Um, so that might be something of interest to the question. Thank you very much. I wonder if any of the panelists, the dear colleagues, have any additional comment before closing this, uh, I do believe, very successful event. Professor Arvanitakis, any additional comment you would like? No? Okay. Then I would like to thank you, all of you, very much. That was extremely appreciated. The globality of the approach, the comparativeness of the approach, and also the quality of the presentations were very much appreciated. The whole audience remained until now, after two and a half hours, almost three hours of presentations and discussion. So we are looking forward to welcome you again in person uh, in Greece for another very fruitful exchange of views. And we wish you a very good morning, very good night, and uh, looking forward to welcome you again. Many thanks to all participants for your questions, your passions, and your participation throughout the whole event. Thank you very much, Professor Avanitakis, for your nice ideas. All the best.